Chris Vaughn, who is the SVP Operations um, Spectrum Reach, and Tom Sly, who heads up the revenue operations for EW Scripts, which is the uh, EW, not the Scripts uh, SNI uh, part of Discovery. And uh, what, we're, what I want to start is we're looking at a transition from linear to digital. 80% of the revenue or higher, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, is going to Google and Facebook. Is, is the battle lost? I'll start and say I don't think so at all, especially when we look at our local operations. And so, you know what, in fact, for those that know Gordon Burrell, does a lot of forecasting in local media, he said five years ago that everything will be programmatic. And I'm like, there's no way. The window company, the uh, whatever, the plumber, you know, plumbing company, the, the landscaping service, the, the lawyers that are advertising with us, they need somebody to hold their hand. They need experts that are going to help guide them through this extremely challenging um, ecosystem of new digital products that can help build and grow their business. So we have to educate them, first educate our people, then educate the clients. And there's always going to be, I think, be a need for that local yeah, and I would add from a charter spectrum reach perspective, we're seeing the same thing. There's still that foundational piece of television, and I would say it's a trans uh, transition as much as it is an augmentation. They're still going to build on that TV, and they're going to want the digital products, the targetability, the accountability, uh, the attribution, all of those pieces, but the best thing on TV is still TV for us. I would say that uh, you know those companies that did well to build that audience and get the, the, a nice revenue stream through a simplified workflow, did so without a lot of competition from you know, historical publishers in a real premium environment. And so as that matures, you'll start, I would anticipate you see that start to uh, sway a little bit more. Well, so you, all of you from different perspectives, whether it's uh, as a national broadcast or local media, local media, uh, you're facing very stiff operational challenges to get some of these campaigns on. Off the air. Uh, one of the one of the things that we talked about when we uh, when we had a prep session was the event-based uh, purchasing uh, from buyers. And one of the folks who was supposed to be here on the panel today, Phil Lamont, um, wasn't able to join us because there is a live event that's taking place. He has to take care of an inventory that is going to change around. It's, this is a big part of um, very complex executions. How is that affecting your side of the so those are the challenges I think that are really exciting for what we just do as a job and a function, right? So if you came in and you had to do the exact same thing you did every day as you did the day before, you'd get kind of bored with that. So you know, from a sales perspective, from NBC to our clients, we want to be able to sell to them any way they want to buy our content. So if they want to buy audience, if they want to buy event, if they want to buy data metrics, if they want to buy A through agency, through advertiser, those are all uniquely complex and how you operationalize that for the same set of potential inventory in a particular place. We find that as a fun challenge. You know, we want to simplify the buying and selling and the ease and the you know, complexity that it takes to get that done. We'll spin place like crazy behind the scenes to make it work and then get better at it every single day. Well, well Chris, in local media, I'm sure that your buyers don't have any complexity. It's completely no, different. They're, they're a piece of cake. I'll tell you, I'll give you real life examples in Columbus, Ohio. We can sell Ohio State football for a ridiculous premium. Now I can, through our set-top box data, demonstrate to you, we have that same audience on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday on the Weather Channel, on CNN, on TBS, but they still pay that premium for that event base. So we try to wean them off of that, and, and but if they want to pay us that and they want to be in the football game, we totally understand that. We're also trying to demonstrate that audience is still there. Monday Night Football, they're there, they're still the same people on Tuesday, they're just watching the Housewife show on Bravo. So we're looking at a combination of both, and as you said, it makes the back office a little more complicated if you've got an event buy mixed in with an audience based buy and what the goals are, uh, but it's our job, as you said, to spin the plates in the background and, and try to take that away and give them the easy one. This, Tom, this line sounds like a um, um, educational moment. Who do we need to educate? I mean, it's across the board, right? So we first, I think we have to start, first start with our salespeople because they are the, the front line that's educating the clients. And so, so we have a learning and leadership development team. Every product, every event, everything that goes out, there's a comps plan that goes with it, there's a training plan that goes with it. Um, we have 
a team that actually travels market to market and trains on specific products. Um, we, have, we have Newsy, which is our OTT brand, that actually we're using as an extension product uh, in our local markets. And we have a, a woman who, uh, all she does is work with the local markets to train and handle all the logistical uh, questions that they might have, working with the operations teams and everything. But it's sticky, it's not easy. And, and then when you put an event on top of it or something else, it gets really complicated. Yeah, but how do you get out of this event based and convince, if this is both on the marketer side and their representatives, how do you convince them to look at this differently and buying an audience in the segment? Well, you, you know, well, I, it's funny what Tom said, it kind of resonated with me. We have to sell it twice. We have to sell it to our internal salespeople. They have to believe it, know it. If you don't, they can smell it on you when you go out there. So you have to do that piece. And then you have to lead them. But, I'll tell you, if a buyer truly does not want to be convinced, uh, we'll give them our best advice, we'll give them what our best recommendation and our experience tells us, but if they still want to buy the event and they're, and they're not there yet on audience, especially when we're dealing with different segments, and we talked about this before, we've got a small business, we've got a medium-sized agency, we've got a national, and they're all in different places along the continuum and the maturation process as to where they are. We'll go with them on that journey and give them our best advice, give them our best data, and hope that they continue on it and make the right choice. Yeah, and, and to follow up on that, it's you know being prepared, right? So your sales teams are armed. They've got the right uh, things to talk about with their clients and what that value is. Some clients will find that as a value. That's what they want when they make a purchase. Others want re frequency and reach, right? And they may want it yesterday. They may, they may want it in five years. And we'll sell that to them also. But you know, as you make it easy and you have the capability and you can communicate that effectively and give them good return against that audience and what is that is it data behind that is it measurement behind that whatever those things are that help facilitate that um, people will come when they're ready right but do you do you think that the AEs have the ability to traverse both sides of unified planning well it's interesting all three mics went out well yeah <laughs> uh, We've launched a variety of products and we've seen that process, that learning process. I can think back when we launched our own first internal news channels. We had a specialist, you couldn't possibly talk about news. Now it's one of our channels. Uh, so we've got 58,000 channels that we insert out there across Spectrum Reach, and that's just another channel. As we do the new digital and advanced advertising products, we do send a specialist along. It's generally a four-legged sales call. But as time goes on, the AEs will be more and more comfortable. I got this, I understand data. But we're not going to let them drive a car until they get their learner's permit, and I got my foot over the brake over here, and, uh, and until they have that competency and feel confident again, because you don't want to be in front of a, an advertiser and you don't have your own together. But it, it is resetting the standard for what was that sale historically, right? So what was that sales process? You know, I went to a conference not too long ago, and a big newspaper publisher talked about when they went from a paper-based news process to a digital-based news process, they lost 80% of their sales staff because they couldn't translate and transition into the new world. And nobody wants to go through that, right? So you've got to train, you've got to learn, you've got to educate, and it, it takes time and effort, but it has to be done. I, I was yeah. gonna say that in addition to having that four-legged call with an expert, we also make sure that we have an expert back on the operations side. And so it's critically important if, if we go out and the salesperson's been trained and they sell and it's their you know relationship integrity with the buyer and if things don't go right first off the buyer's not going to buy again worse off the salesperson's not going to sell it again um, because it ruins their reputation within the marketplace and they'll never do that so it's we have to make the investment I mean, we work with you to to help design our entire workflow on that and, uh, and we have a specialist in-house that are making sure that everything works smoothly on the back side and even supports the salesperson along the way. Uh, let's, so let's peel the onion out a little bit because you guys are the ones that get punched all the time by everyone in this supply chain. And this is a skill set challenge, not just for the, the salespeople. You also need to have the internal operations to be able to execute these two. So I want to ask you um, two things. One, what are the challenges of executing these when you have disparate skill sets internally on your teams? But two, is there also a, a translation challenge that you see between the conversation the AE had with a buyer who may be unprepared for unified planning, a seller who you know, hopefully is in a four-legged call is somewhat uh, skilled to, uh, to sell it, 
and then it gets handed off to sales planners and working with people who have to really interpret it and you have to execute it. I think you've been spying on my back room. <laughs> Um, this one's very near and dear to my heart. I exist on the operations side. I think the number one mistake that we make is not having the right expectation up front. There was a definition or a product parameter that either we didn't understand operationally or the client didn't understand. And I can't tell you how many campaigns I've tried to optimize in flight with a new parameter. It's a click-through rate or a dwell time or a report. And I, who promised this? You know, who expected that? Um, so that, that's a big part of the education process. That leads to disappointment for your back office, your average, everybody's disappointed. So it feels like a no up front, uh, but it's actually, you're gonna get the no at the end of the month. So let me go ahead and tell you that that's not gonna be a part of your product set. Uh, I can't deliver that, but I can deliver this. This is what I can deliver. And setting that expectation up front will cut the disappointment for the advertiser, for your back office, and probably lead to you know, happy life. That's the biggest part. I'd say you can't be afraid to push it back. And so and we, we do that. And so the order comes in, the expectations haven't been set properly. And so and sometimes you just have to say no. And you have to go back and, and it's sometimes it's a little embarrassing for the salesperson. We try to do it in a tactful way. We we maybe will say that this will work better for the advertiser and we that's how we communicate it to the advertiser. Um, but there's nothing worse than setting it up completely against what it'll deliver and it's not working well for the client. And then again, salesperson's not going to sell it again, client's not going to buy it again. It's a bad thing all the way around. And it's hard. And it takes planning, it takes effort, it takes engagement. You've got to be at the beginning of those planned products that you're, we're going to go to market with so you understand how you can line up underneath that to operationalize it. And then from there, what's that strategy? How do you take employees with skill sets and effectiveness and then how much you know, runway do you have to get this done and how much time does it take and which systems does it take and you know all of that takes work and effort and uh, and but it you know that's what we're going to market with so we got to we got to deliver oh, Tom when you talk about um, making those adjustments to the flying and going back to to the buyer you don't always have that permission and, that, and the reason you don't have that permission is because the buyer doesn't have the understanding of how you could be more valuable to them. But even in the local market, sometimes the buyer has sold it to the client improperly, and that's a lot of times where the communication chain is already broken. And so is that because the salesperson didn't sell it right, you know, didn't, and didn't uh, educate them properly? Um, it's, it's hard to say, but it's important that you fix it before it doesn't run properly. And sometimes that means you don't get the order because they want you to do something that you're not capable of doing. But uh, we would much rather deliver uh, success than not deliver success, right? Yeah, I, I look, it's hard because the salespeople get no all day long and the last thing I want to do is be the, you know, the sales prevention guy in the back room and, and tell them no. Uh, but you're going to find out it's a no eventually. Uh, I'd rather have that honest dialogue, and as Tom said, uh, couch that with, okay, here's what I can do for you. I understand where you're going, but here, here's another way to get there. And this is my capability, and this is what I can deliver. And there is power in no. You, you do respect it because you're gonna find out eventually it's a no. So let's talk about the, the, the two things that came up. We talked about the operations, and you started to touch on the systems and the data. So let's talk about the data. What, what is it that marketers could be looking at that would bring more value, that, that the programmers could bring more value to the marketers if they use it. I'll, I'll take a stab. I mean, it's part of what you talked about earlier. Um, we can demonstrate through a variety of data sources that we have that those audiences are there. If you want the vanity of being in the right football game or the right event, we will sell you that. We understand that that's value and cachet, and we get paid a premium for that but we can also demonstrate to you, we have an internal tool that will maximize your dollars and it's to your benefit as an advertiser. Here's our lowest price, best available inventory that will clear. The robot says so. I got plenty of avails here. They're reasonably priced and I can demonstrate to you that the audience is there. Take it, I'm not trying to put one over you. This is the best deal. This is what I would buy. This is what the computer came up with. So if we have something like that, that feels like Switzerland, 
Uh, this is make your own decision, and, and we, we present that data to them. If they still want to just absolutely be on CNN with Anderson Cooper, we'll do that for you too. But we can demonstrate that those viewers are there all day long, and we have them at a lower price, and you're going to get a better bang for your buck. So uh, again, we'll let them make their choice. We'll put the data in front of them. Uh, but that's a system that we use over and over and over. If you provide great flexibility, you can fulfill more dollars, right? So if an advertiser or an agency comes and they say, we want to use you our data. getting more permission from the brands to do it. Yeah, and if, we want, if we want to use their data, if they want to use our data, our products, you know, we can provide different solutions to help fulfill what they're trying to And, and you're not talking do. necessarily about sharing the data that you don't want to share about uh, viewership insights, or from the other side, you're talking about marrying it and, and using the insights from either to energy. Right. You know, I think one of the disconnects that we see on the local level is because we're selling these integrated, integrated omnichannel campaigns that have lots of different products, is pulling all the different data sources from each product together and being able to present that in a way that makes a lot of sense to the advertiser. And so that's a disconnect right now. And I know that we're asked for it. We have dashboards where we pull you know, the various data segments together and we blend it as best we can, but there's really not a pure way to do it. And we're asked repeatedly by the advertisers, we want more, um, a better understanding of exactly what we're buying when we're putting it all together. Because there's duplication there that often we can't even measure, right? So I want to open up to the audience. I don't know if we have a microphone here um, for any questions from the audience. No, we have to hand it to them. So we do have to hand it to them. So one of the other areas that, so we, we talked uh, about the data and we talked about that permission. What would, what is the difference between the buyer segments that you're looking at between SMB, national that's direct and um, enterprise through the agency? How, how does this complexity break down differently from your perspective? I, I, I'll take a stab at it. Tom, I know you can deal with it too. We have local direct clients, a lot of times you'll spend everybody hold on to your hats now. A $1,000 schedule for us in, in Yakima is a pretty good deal. We'll take it. And then we've got people who spend you know, tens of millions of dollars on an enterprise basis. We have to be able to quickly throttle between the level of sophistication, expectation, product set between all of those. And a lot of times using some of the same tool sets in different ways. So if we are the agency of record, which we end up being for these small, direct, local clients, we have to help them with production, with research for the first time, helping them pick out the audience that they want and, and how to uh, actually formulate their buy. And then we have to quickly change gears with a holding company who comes in here and wants to drop tens of millions of dollars on us. But the funny thing is that those less sophisticated buyers give you the flexibility for, for them to be more successful. They do. They do. Um, because you know, all in, we've got 30, 40 different products, including data attribution, all these things that they can take advantage of. And we do wind up becoming that back office for them. And, and really, we do feel like a, a turnkey agency at some point. We may be upside down on some of those $1,000 clients, but don't tell my boss because it keeps us all gainfully employed. Um, but it, it is a heavy lift for a small local business to get them everything that they need. But that's what the marketplace requires. One of the things that I, I know from the, the stuff that you guys have been doing uh, at uh, EW is this full service agency model that goes beyond uh, media. It's additional service. Yeah, and it's, it's um, what should I say? It's clunky in some ways, right? We, we, um, we built some uh, workflows and processes that make it easier. Um, as we said before, all the way from education to implementation. Um, you know, I, th these days, most of the national, if you will, advertisers on, um, you know, on our digital assets come programmatically, right? So uh, the vast majority of the business have been switching there. So, so that's largely an automated business anymore. And, and then we have regi large regional, um, we'll call local, um, but regional advertisers uh, that may buy the products. And they can buy anything from us. And we've built the workflows. So they can buy any markets. They can buy the country. They can even buy markets that we're not, um, you know, we don't have assets in. And, uh, but, but it really came down to, we've spent a lot of time with you, Duran, you remember, building out the workflows, building out the process, building out the teams, building out the support um, to make it easier. And of course, on the TV side, the linear side of the business, that's the, they're still doing business the way they've done it for whatever, 50 years.
And those workflows and processes, while making it more efficient and easier, are also service elements, right? Because it's easier, because it's more efficient, it's a better service back to the customer. Are you seeing that from the larger enterprise buyers that they are asking? Yes, yeah, so we have, like in the upfront, we've got connected systems that allow our advertisers to start to register their dollars with us and connected systems to our systems rather than having to, you know, go through this massive spreadsheet, you know, Excel back and forth late, late nights. And we're transitioning business in a faster element just through really good partners helping us to build those tools and, and giving us an advantage in those conversations. The way you are describing it, it sounds different than what uh, they're seeing on the local because they are going in and building microsites and they're managing their Google and Facebook campaigns. What are the value-added services on the enterprise through the agency that you see? So just those custom executions, the uh, full uh, full page takeover was on the display side, or having an event uh, at, at the plaza with the Today Show. Yeah, they're all similar, right? So. The scale might be different, the cost might be different, but we'll do custom creative for unique advertisers up against a, the first spot in This Is Us. So when you're watching This Is Us, you have a very contextual feel and emotion towards that program segment. We can extend that, and we have done that with advertisers into that first spot in the break where it's got the look and the feel and the tone of the show so that that emotes and brings ad lift and brand lift and you know effectiveness to that advertiser. So there's opportunity to be able to to reach deeper and deeper into the partnerships, whether that's through workflow or automation or ideas or creativity, and it can be all the way at the local level to the national level. Yeah, I mean, uh, true, there is an expectation. Because you see a mix of both, right? Yeah, we do. We, uh, we absolutely do. And I, I think one of the things that we do bring to the enterprise, though, is uh, attribution. You know, is this really working? Uh, and can you take the data and since you have all these products, you know, we're, we're an ISP as well, we can talk about what actually happened after they left the TV viewing experience. Did they engage? Did they visit my website? Did they actually convert once they got there? Uh, the accountability is mind-numbing. Uh, it, it was a great business when we were just able to throw a TV spot up there and say everybody saw it and life is good. But how many people actually went to my website? Did they convert? What was the lifetime value of that client after they converted? They in a five mile radius of my business. There's a lot of accountability that goes on now. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up a really scary term. Currency. Sea flight? You wanna call it? <laughs> what are you trying to sell? To maybe describe what sea flight is. So sea flight is the capability for us to find our audience wherever uh, content is seen, aggregate that back into a level of a normalized rating that makes sense to an advertiser or an agency. Across the linear and Across digital. linear and digital. So wherever we, we can watch our content, that's we, we want to provide value for our advertisers against that audience. Um, and so being able to do that, it's been we, we rolled it out last year, it's been very successful for us in regards to the feedback we've gotten, gotten from many advertisers and that they like that someone took a chance to recognize that there's a value for the total audience and that they're getting that value because that's important for the agency, remember, to report back to their clients and their advertisers that they're reaching all of these people in these different places and here's a real clear communicative way to make that happen. And then from our perspective, we've, we're, we're providing that as an open source. And so what I've said, it's, it's not exactly plugging A into B to get C, but it's the context and the the idea of C flight that will work with our uh, publishing partners to help build that for them because people are different, businesses are different, systems are different, but if you can get enough of the unique capabilities and we'll help you build that, I think there's just larger scale and be able to provide those services to traditional customers. The, uh, Chris, uh, the, how, how does currency uh, further complicate your world? Well, I was gonna say from, from our aspect, we can actually see which device you're watching on, and uh, sometimes I call it desperation viewing. Uh, that if I see you're in your house and you're watching on the smallest possible device, somebody else has seized control of the main set-top box. You're on the back porch and you're trying to watch golf, and everybody else is watching a cartoon inside. That it's very, it's well creepy, and creepy. But uh, you're right. <laughs> uh, are all impressions created equally? I don't know. I think the jury's still out. Is the immersive 65-inch HD experience worth the same thing as the snacking I'm doing on my iPad on the back porch while I'm 
also, you know, sipping lemonade and watching a kid cut the grass. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think the marketplace is going to help us define that uh, because because we can see all of that. We'd like to think that if they could get it on the big screen in the living room, they'd be watching there. They're not for some other reason. They're, they're in bed. They're on the recliner. They're out back. It's, room who knows but is that the same experience and is that impression and, and if they fast forwarded and saw one frame does that count as a view well yeah that, that's the other part that we have to define and, and I think we're holding ourselves to a higher standard we have video on demand products where we have completion rates and everything else and then I see some of the things that are going on in the wild wild west of digital and you know do you really know where you're at is uh, I think we have a responsibility to do to do right it's going to serve us all in the long run I was going to say on the measurement piece, I mean, the industry still is grappling with uh, different currencies, right? And um, and that's what I was talking to earlier about. These The advertisers want a better view of what's really happening in their campaigns. They want to understand um, you know, how many times there's duplication of their campaigns. Because, because when we're buying OTT and pre-roll, and then they're also buying linear, I mean, it's, today it's difficult for us to know. I think people might have better view, better view into that because of the data that you're able to capture um, through your systems and the boxes and so on but Brad called it creepy uh, yeah <laughs> it is a little creepy uh, so I'm, I'm gonna watch uh, be more cautious about what I'm watching at home on my little screen you should, you so should. Uh, but but so that you know that's a challenge that we all face there we go there's another one um, two left yeah so and your turn uh, but, 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 so the uh, this is what the advertiser are asking for from us and I think we as an industry we've got to figure out how to solve that I, I remember four years ago you know making national calls in New York talking about, you know, will they ever get away from, the buyers ever get away from a GRP? And, a project, and I was, project Canoe? Yes. Well, that, that was after that died, I think. After the canoe sunk. Uh, but, uh, and, and I was told no. They said there's no way that a brand manager at P&G is going to risk their job when they know to launch a new brand in a market, they need however many, 400 GRPs a week for this many weeks, whatever it is. They said they just don't see that changing today. And now when you go in, it's a different story. So we're getting there, but we're not there yet. I uh, wanted to open up if there are any questions in the audience. Okay, so if you are looking now at that, that actually that perspective of the audience and the creepy factor is exactly that data layer overlay that we talked about before because that insight, on one hand, we don't want it to be creepy, but that is exactly the overlay that the marketer can benefit from. What does that look like? What do you think that looks like in the future? How do you bridge the creepy factor? I, I think we'll have a standard and it'll be acceptable and people will just understand how that data is mined and, and where that comes from more clearly. Um, and for certain advertisers, I think that will be always a really interesting point for them to want to buy against and get specific against an audience. And then I think others, you know, they'll want to continue just on general reach and frequency. You know, there's... Um, you know, we, we have this conversation often around if everything you saw was curtailed directly to you only for what all the data about you says who you are, would you buy other things? How do you, how do you start to get influenced about other types of products and, and services if you only buy what you know about? So what, what is that science? What does that future look like? You know, and it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we, we see it in a number of the digital products that we buy through extension, uh, you know, retargeting and the, the search engine marketing that we do. Uh, so I would tell you that on the, the cable side, we are very protective of that data and we hold it very close to the best. Um, but on the digital side, we've all experienced it where, hey, how was your stay last night at, you know, such and such hotel? That's nice. Uh, come home on the, uh, the, the phone. So it, it, is, it is a very onerous responsibility. And uh, I know it plays in advertising, but we have to be very careful. Yeah, and I, I would say, um, you know, I, I know I have this conversation with my wife all the time when she's on Nordstrom.com and is looking at a pair of shoes, and then it follows her around for the rest of the week. Retargeting. Yeah, a month or whatever. And she thinks that's very creepy. And I'm like, well, wouldn't you rather see that than a, a muffler ad, right, or something, uh, car parts or football or something? And so um, there's a balance, certainly, in what we need to do. I, I, I wonder a little bit about, you know, we have GDPR, and then we have the California initiative that's coming out, and how that's going to affect us. And I think that as an industry, we're all now saying, you know, we need to be certainly more responsible. But I think for the most part, like, cable has always been so protective of the data. 
And in fact, when I worked for a division of Comcast, and if we could get nothing, um, I mean, if we were inside the company, then we could literally get nothing. So I think I think the industry has largely been respectful. The next wave of it, um, how do you minimize the creepiness? Yeah, that's the question. I know. I mean, do you guys like sometimes you're talking and your phone's on the table, and then you come home at night and you turn on OTT television, and now there's an ad for what you were talking about. And so a lot of people think that's really creepy, uh, but I guess it's targeting, right? So. Well, this. That's a whole conversation that leads into generational expectations. We did a study around uh, the patterns of Generation Z, and uh, we, we all know that the folks like us who may be creating GDPR standards are of a very different perspective than the, the kids who are going to become future consumers. They have a different expectation for privacy. So it, it looks like the world of data is going to be very exciting, and how that feeds into better insights to consumers. Any last thoughts around all of this? Um, I will tell you, uh, be patient with us in the back room. We'll get it right. And uh, I, think, I think it was Brad who said it's our job to keep those plates and hamsters and all that swinging in the back room. And you know, it's going to be a wonderful meal. Just don't look in the kitchen. So uh, that's our job. <laughs> don't check the sausage, maybe. Yeah, you don't want to know, but it's going to be fantastic. And Enjoy it's, it. It's best done when you don't see or know the chaos is even existing, exactly. right? So that's, that's when we know we've got it right, when everything just runs smoothly and nobody has any idea. Really well, no one disappears from a panel because they have to fix it. Right, exactly. That's right. Yeah, and then uh, I would say just you know plan for the future. Just really start to you know not operate in re reactive mode, but you know get very aggressive about how you handle the change. Thank you very much.